Well, hello from Victoria. I'm probably going to read a little bit of this because my brain doesn't work sometimes all that well, particularly as I'm a bit nervous presenting to you today. I have been a passionate, I have been a passionate e-bike rider. Um, I used to ride a normal bike, but as I've got older, I found that just as too difficult. And I don't, if any of you know Castlemaine in this region, it is quite hilly. It's not like uh, the mountains you've got in Tassie, but it's certainly hilly enough for me. Um, and my knees were suffering on riding a normal bike. So I just stopped riding altogether. And then about four years ago, I discovered an e-bike and haven't stopped riding since. I discovered though, that buying one wasn't all that easy. Buying an e-bike e by brand alone doesn't always give you the best fit for you because it's generally about the components on the bike and how they function rather than the brand of the bike uh, because all different brands have all different components on them and understanding how the components work is actually a for or the value of particular components is actually really important to helping you uh, pick a bike that suits you. So basically that's what I'm going to talk about today is the components to give you a bit of an understanding of what they are. But first of all, let's bust a couple of myths. It's, it's a common myth of cheating. Um, that it, well, that's what I hear all the time, but you're cheating. And it really upsets me actually, because it isn't cheating. I'm still riding, I'm still pedaling. You cannot ride an e-bike without pedaling. And it is a bench bike, not a motorbike. Um, if, you to, if you compare um, a normal bike with an e-bike, they are different. You get assistance from an e-bike, but you're still, still actually pedaling. I read a statement yesterday and I'm going to read a couple of days ago and I'll read it to you now because I think it sums up this concept of cheating. The accusation that an e-bike, that e-bikes are cheating completely falls apart if the alternative is hopping in a car. Um, and that's the way it is. If you want to ride a bike or if you want to hop in a car, so it's not cheating. There's also the issue of fitness, which is often raised about whether or not you can get fit or whether there's any fitness in it at all. Um, but current studies are showing that there are distinct cardiovascular benefits from e-bike riding. And anecdotally, I can certainly talk about um, uh, what it's done for my knees. I have bad knees, have done um, and still do have. But what has actually happened in riding the e-bike is I've been able to strengthen everything around my knee and it's made a huge difference to almost every other part of my life. So I love them. Why would you get one? Well, there was a major study done at the Oregon University in the use of e-bikes. And what they found was that people actually rode more often when they had an e-bike than, than they did when they had a normal bike. When they were asked, why they hadn't previously ridden their normal bike. They said the hills were too difficult, the destinations were too far, and they didn't like, like arriving sweaty. These are some of the reasons that people cite as well on top of that. Um, and my one was to get me back on a bike. That's why I bought mine. Um, many people buy it to replace a car so that they, for the environmental reasons, um, or just cheaper than running a car too. Um, convenience in the city and not having to find car parking. It's a quicker ride than a normal bike and you can arrive without sweating. And equal, equalizers, which means different standards of riders can ride together. So if you've got a partner who's a bit slower than you um, or a bit faster than you, the e-bike equalizes that out. Hills and headwinds are no problem. Um, 
I don't even think about hills or the winds anymore because it's, it is no problem to me. It's much easier to carry heavy loads um, of shopping from the shops to home. It is exercise and not only that, it is also great fun. There's five different types of e-bikes and you'll need to think about which one would suit you the best. I'll show you all five pictures of them and explain a little bit about what they're used for. The first one is what we're commonly used to, I guess, a standard commuting, shopping or utility bike. That's the sort of bike you would ride down to the street or just go for a fun ride with or to ride to work. Then there's the touring bikes. And this is the sort of bike I have. That's very similar to mine, because I do a lot of touring, a bit like Di. Um, and they're built a little bit uh, differently in order to carry a load. Loads on the front or loads on the back. As you can see, big loads and even bigger loads but they're slightly different to a normal bike on the, uh, that we saw on the previous slide. Then we've got mountain bikes, which are really sleek, have nothing extra on them. You can see there's no, hand, no mud guards, no panniers, and they're, they're just a bike, they're a bike uh, built for purpose. Just some other examples. Also got fat tires because of the terrain that they're riding on. Just note here, this is actually the battery. That's becoming a lot more common now in terms of putting the battery into the frame. Then there's the cargo or delivery bikes. You might want it to carry luggage to deliver things. So it might be a Postie or a, um, a Uber Eats driver. Or you might just want to take the kids or the grandchildren out. Then there's the last one, which is the um, folding bikes or compacts. And they, they're used for a range of different things. A lot of people use them if they've got caravans because they're easy to store and um, they put them in the caravan uh, and, and take them out when they arrive at a destination and they then have an e-bike to ride around in the locale that they're in. And other people use them for commuting. They might get on a train or a bus with them. And then when they get off, they can unfold it and ride to their destination. They don't generally go quite as far as both of the other two. They're not used for long distance riding as a general rule. There's three important things on an e-bike, because an e-bike provides um, assistance through the use of electricity and the battery. The, this, is the, this is just one example. I've used the Bosch system. Um, there's many different examples of what they look like, but this is the components of them. So you've got the motor, you have the battery, and a computer, and a little controller which sits on your handlebars that will allow you to change the computer settings. Just note here, this one here is um, the battery register. So there are five bars, which means the battery is actually full at the moment. As you use it, these bars drop off. I'll talk a little bit more about the controller and what it means a little bit further down the track. But just remember, this is just the Bosch system. There are many others. In Australia, you can go anywhere in Australia that a normal bike can go. You don't need a license and you don't need to registration like you do with a car, but you have the same rights and responsibilities on the road as a car does. The regulations vary around the world um, 
But in Australia, all electric bikes have pedal assist systems with a stated maximum power output of 250 watt and are speed limited to 25 kilometres an hour. What that means is that after 25 kilometres or 27 in some cases, you end up just riding the bike. The motor itself cuts out, so you're no longer riding an electric bike. There's basically two different methods of, of propulsion. One is what they call the pedelec, and that provides power only when you're pedaling, and you select the level of assistance, and you do that with that little controller and your computer. The other one is pretty much the same. It's a power-assisted, but it has a, pro uh, has a throttle, and it provides power, again, only when pedaling, but you have an on-demand throttle, a, a little bit like a motorbike where you can actually hold it on if you want to, if you can't be bothered pedaling. But remember, it is very, um, uses a lot of battery and it doesn't go very fast. Um, it, people use it a lot, the throttle a lot at traffic lights just to give them an instant boost. The motors, this, um, a, few, a couple of different styles of motors. This one is the mid-drive motor and it is located in the centre of the bike. You can see here near the pedal. It's generally built into the frame and it powers through the transmission or the drivetrain. The most common brands are Bosch and Shimano Steps, but there are also many others. This is the, there is also the Yamaha and the Barfang. The mid-drive motor is generally seen as the most efficient and tend to be a bit dearer than the other style of motor, which I'll show you in a minute. It does have central weight, so the weight sits in the middle of the frame, um, but unfortunately often you get more wear and tear on your chain. Um, the Bosch and Shimano brands tend to be the um, more expensive versions. Then you've got the hub motors, which are inside either the front or the back wheel. This is the front one, sits inside the wheel, and this is the back one on the back wheel. They tend to be a little bit less expensive than the mid-drive motor, and they have a different sort of a, a way of propelling the bike. The front one, if it's on the front, it tends to pull the bike along. If it's on the back, it tends to push it. Two of the most common ones of these are Barfang and Samsung. Just be aware that the front um, hub can cause slipping in uh, wet weather and can be a bit of a hazard, particularly for less confident riders. Also be aware that the distribution of the weight is different. If you have a back motor and a battery on the back, the back of the bike can tend to be fairly heavy. Okay, a common question and a common, yes, I guess just a common question is how far can I go? How far can I go on a battery? And it really depends on so many things. It's quoted by manufacturers anywhere between 35 and 130, and so in some cases even more. But it's, it's affected by a whole range of things. And I've taken some screenshots to give you an example of how this works. Um, what I've done is that there's a beautiful little thing called the range assistance, which is on the um, Bosch website. And if you get a chance, go and have a look at it because it's actually quite fun and, and interesting as well. What I've done is I've set it up with um, uh, a, a standard surface. I think it is. Roads with poor quality, um, light breezes, and in the summer, because the wind will affect how far you can go, whether it's a headwind or a tailwind. The surface affects what uh, a distance you can go. It is, a battery is, um, uh, doesn't function quite as well in the real cold, um, so you won't get quite so much difference, distance, and your terrain affects it. What I've done is I've set this as a, a, a hundred, Okay, because the weight of yourself and what you're carrying also affects how far you can go. 
So this one I've set up with just a fairly flat surface and I've put it on the second, can you see here, Echo, Tour, Sport and Turbo. They're the four different uh, levels of assistance. I've set it on a, a, a mid-range one. And you can get 68 kilometres roughly on those choices, a flat one. The next one I've changed, I've left it on the same assistance here and everything else, the only thing I've done is put in hills. And you can see and now, it's, oh, so it's uh, 14, uh, 14, yes, 14 kilometres less. The next one, I've left everything the same on the flat and I've changed the level of assistance. You can see from that, this is what the difference is. So it's, it's double what you would get from here on a flat surface. So the things that affect your uh, distance are the weight you're carrying, the level of assistance, the temperature on the day, the wind resistance, the um, to, uh, surface you're travelling on and uh, whether you're going up and down hills. Okay. Oh, I did, I'm sorry, I have forgotten one thing. I'll just, um, if I may go back. Um, I forgot to talk about the battery life. Um, to maintain your battery life, don't store it for long periods of time, empty or full. Um, we have two batteries at the moment sitting in Germany, which are being monitored regularly. They've been there now 12 months. And if they get too low, we get them to top it up. We should be using them, but we can't. Um, a battery life depends on your number of charge and discharge cycles. And there are usually a thousand within a charge and discharge cycle. What that means is that if you ride and you use half your battery one week, and you top it up, that's only half a charge and discharge cycle. If you go the following week and you do exactly the same, that then becomes one charge and discharge cycle. Sorry, I forgot that little bit. Pretty important, actually. Um, okay, gears. Yes, the most common one, the one we're used to the most and has always been on normal bikes is the derailleur and gear cogs. Um, with an e-bike, you generally get only one gear on the front and all the gear changes occur on the back. That's certainly the case with the mid-drive. You've also got another one which is called a hub gear. I've given you an example of this. It's actually in a sealed room um, and all, all the gearing happens inside. Um, a good way to keep them clean is no oil, no um, dirt can get in. Generally, on a, on, on a, a cog bike, uh, with, I'm sorry, on the gear cog cogs, we have a chain like this. This is the most common. This is a, a, a different version. This is what they call a carbon belt. And uh, it lasts a lot longer. It doesn't stretch uh, like the chain does. Um, but it only has one. It's one uh, gear. Is normally paired with one of these, the hub gears, to give you a range of uh, uh, higher gears, higher and lower gears. One of the joys of this one is it's, it's very um, clean, but you can also change, uh, you don't have to change gears to start off at the lights, which, are, you know, I mean, I'm sorry, you don't have to be pedaling to change gears. Brakes, three different types of brakes. This is the one, there's the disc brake, which is this. This one here, which sits on your wheel. Then you have the rim brakes, which sit, uh, which are the common ones we used to have on bikes where the pressure plates apply to the tires. And then we've got roll brakes, which is, I, I don't know whether you can see that. My picture is underneath all the images. Um, it's this one over here, and it's uh, a little bit like a drum brake. I'll just um, 
yeah, it's a bit like a drum brake and is, is attached to the wheel hub rather than the wheel itself and is often used with the hub gears. One of the things you need to think about with your brakes is you need particularly good stopping power. Rim brakes generally, the ones brakes are generally the, uh, the least expensive of, the, of them all. Um, but they're available on some e-bikes now. I, I think you need a little bit more than that, but that's just a personal opinion. Tyres. Well, your tyres will be determined by the type of riding you're going to do in the first instance. Fatter tyres are really good for rough terrain or mixed terrain, actually, and give you a little bit more stability. Um, or, yeah, a little bit more stability, I guess, is the word for it. Um, what I would suggest, though, is that you get really good tyres. Um, there's nothing worse than having to change your tyre when you've got a motor on the front and disc brakes and all sorts of other things. Um, so get really good ones. I've had no punctures on my tyres, and they've done 6,000 kilometres. I've had to replace them recently. Um, and they aren't cheap. Um, almost the cost of a, a car tyre, it cost me $100 for each tyre. But they're perfect. They're fantastic. I haven't had a puncture. Now, these are the displays um, or the computers. This one is a Bosch. And this one here is a Shimano. There are, are other different varieties. I've just these two as an example. And this one down here, which is quite common or becoming more common, is the use of a smartphone and an app. Um, it's not my personal favourite, but a lot of people love them um, and uh, they, they are becoming quite popular. Just to explain what's on the computer, we've got um, a, an on button, this is your light, and an eye, which gives you uh, the ability to change the display in here. At the moment, what that's telling me is that the rider is riding at 18 kilometres an hour, 18.4. Um, if I were to press the I button, I would probably get a clock or a um, distance travelled or how long I've been on the bike or a, a range of different things. The odometer, uh, so that changes in here once you press that. These other parts, this is your battery. Remember before I showed you it had five bars? Well, this one has used one bar, so it's actually had a bit of use. This is your levels of assistance. And these are the same on all, on pretty much all, all computers. I'm just showing you this one. This is, it, when it's down in here, it's off. Then you have Echo, Tour, Sport and Turbo. This little one here indicates that the person needs to change gear, that they're not getting the maximum out of their motor or their bike. One of the things you need to make sure of, though, whenever you, when you buy a computer, is that you are able to change it without taking your hand, take, change, change any function on your computer without taking your hands off your handlebars. This one's pretty um, straightforward. I'll read it. Um, years ago, when I was younger, I rode like this. As I've got older, I now ride like this. Um, and that is to do with comfort and stability and being able to control the bike better as I've got older. So that uh, upright, more upright position gives you that little bit more stability and comfort. If you don't want to do that, there's also the option of a recumbent, which is brings you lower to the road and uses a different style of pedalling. You're pushing backwards and forwards rather than up and down. The price of an e-bike, well, they do vary re very regularly, but it is generally determined by the components that you have on the bike. For example, a Bosch mid-drive or a Shimano mid-drive is more expensive than a rear hub motor by Barfang. Disc brakes are more expensive than rim brakes, so it makes a difference what components are on your bike. 
just think about this for a minute. Um, if you think about the components that are on your bike, the battery itself is, is somewhere between $1,000 and $1,500 to buy without the bike. Uh, a, a charger to go with the battery is about $200 without the bike. And uh, the controller itself, I think, is around $200. So you're up to nearly $200, uh, sorry, $2,000 uh, just in the components, let alone the motor and the bike itself. There are, of course, lots of specialist designs and you can almost go up to, I think this one's pretty expensive, um, you know, in the over the 20,000s. I'm not sure. I don't really know the price of that one. And this one, which is designed and, and it doesn't even look like an e-bike. Um, and I think it's, it's very expensive as well. So you can go for particular designs if you want and they can go anywhere up to 40, 50,000. So same price as a car if you want. You, if you can't, um, if you don't want to buy one outright, you can do it through Innovated Leasing through this particular company here. And another way is in Victoria at the moment, and I'm, I would imagine it'll get to Tasmania at some stage where you can rent to own. So you pay a deposit and a weekly fee and uh, in six months you own it. What to do next? Well, the important thing is to determine what is important to you. Does it matter what colour it is? Does it matter what it looks like when you're riding it? Do you need to have a step through? Um, or do you, are you comfortable with a bar? Is the weight important? E-bikes are heavier than normal bikes as a general rule, um, but uh, you know, if, if you need to lift it in and out of things, the weight may be uh, important. How compact you need it? Do you need a fold up one? Do you need suspension, front or back or both? I have suspension on the front because I have really bad arthritis in my wrists and it certainly seems to help that. Stability, things like the fatness of your tyres will determine that and uh, where you have your, basically your, your main weight and your price, of course. So once you've done all of that and made a list of the things that are important to you, go out and test ride and test ride and test ride. Try as many as you can because they all do ride differently, or not all of them, but they're all pretty, um, they have different, different features um, and you will determine from test ride which are the ones that suit you. Consider your future needs. Think about what you might want to do in the future. Just uh, to tell you where I came from, um, I had, had really no idea what I wanted until I thought about what I needed it for. And I wanted something that would last me for quite some time. We had in mind we would tour and that that would include overseas. So we had to get something that was possible to get batteries for overseas because you cannot take batteries on a plane. And we, discovered, we decided that the Bosch was the most universally available and went for that. And we do, as I said before, have now two batteries in Europe, which are Bosch. But you can, in some places in Europe, uh, hire batteries. Uh, and again, the most common is the Bosch, but that may change at the moment, that's where it is. Once you've done all of that and determined what it is you want to do, not just now, but in the future, because you might buy a bike now and, and it'll, uh, your needs will change. Once you've done all of that, get fitted. Uh, go and check the frame size, make sure it all fits for you. Insurance, there's a couple of ways of doing this. Um, first of all, I'd suggest you check your house insurance because some people have it already included in their house insurance um, and others don't. But if you uh, don't have it included and you still want to insure your bike, uh, there are specialist bike insurers and they have online uh, quoting mechanisms. And I tried one the other day for my bike and determined that my, if my bike was still worth 4000 um, I would be paying $300 a year for insurance, which is pretty much close to a, the price for a car, actually. Um, 
register your bike with Bike Vault, um, a place where you can log in and fairly simply register your bike. So if it is stolen, there is a, a place you can, um, it, it may show up as, as being, coming clear on that Bike Vault. Somebody, uh, uh, maybe Di can explain a little bit more about that. Yeah, sure. So Bike Vault is a free service that you can um, access via Facebook or through the web, the link. I've put the link in the chat room, in the chat session, if you want to pull up um, that. Uh, basically, you just set aside some time, take some photos of your bike, note down the serial numbers, um, and once it's recorded against your name, then if the worst happens and someone steals it, then... Um, out in the other in the world, um, but, um, bike shops and sometimes really um, enthusiastic bike riders and sometimes the police will be checking Bike Vault for similar bikes if, if they come across them and they'll contact you. Thanks, Di. Then there's locks. Whatever you do, get a good one. This one up here is what I've commonly uh, heard called now a cafe lock. Um, called that because people maintain you shouldn't uh, leave. You can lock it up, but make sure you can see it. Don't leave it. Um, and, and I can vouch for that. We had two of these on our bikes in Bordeaux and nearly lost both bikes because we came back and one of them was almost severed through. So when we came back home, we both bought uh, different, um, much less, uh, what's the word for it? Breakable. Uh, they can't be cut. They can't easily cut anyway. Uh, we ended up getting one similar to this, which folds up into a little pack and sits nice and compact on the side of the, uh, on the side of the bike. These are great too. These are good, um, but they're bulky and difficult to carry. So of course we don't want to carry them overseas on an airplane. <laughs> 